means of uh, employment. And that's a huge challenge. <clears throat> now, when you, when you study further, you see other research telling you that six years, people graduate <coughs> and still looking for jobs for six years, right? When you bring it home, there are over 100,000 people that graduate on the in the country every year. But would you believe that about 10%, only about 10% of that number find jobs within one year? The problem is not that there are no jobs. Of course, there might not be enough jobs, but there are jobs. The big problem is that some people do not know the criteria required to, required, um, to get those jobs. So we are going to be talking about this subject, jobs for the Guinean youth. Where are the jobs? How do you find them? And what are, for this session, what are the stakeholders involved doing in creating the, the jobs? And how can you access it through their industry? Now, having said that also, we'll be indexing again on different careers. We have a finance person here. We have somebody who is in programs. We have also someone in, in the agri sector. Uh, Mr. Sarisha is now here, but um, the CFO yeah, is here to represent him. So I'm also expecting to hear some of the careers that they will recommend that people um, plan for and the preparatory uh, strategies that you can use to get to where they are today. So first of all, the rubric we're using is that they will give 10 minutes of keynotes. After that session of keynotes, which is their individual speech, then of course we call them back to ask them those specific questions that you might have in your mind. Now, having said that, I will welcome Prince to the stage. Gladiator. I, I am, am a gladiator. gladiator. I am a gladiator. I am a gladiator. This venue you are speaking with, if you step on the battlefield, someone boot you somewhere. Else. <laughs> I am a gladiator. I am a gladiator. Awesome, awesome. So um, Tom has said it all. Tom has said it all. We know the purpose for this session. We are looking at jobs for the Ghanaian youth. And ladies and gentlemen, I mean, there are so many events that we attend and leave the same. I want you to purpose in your heart that you're going to pick something away yeah. something tangible these gentlemen are very busy people and they have uh, you know left their staff they've come here so please engage them when we come to events like this questions time people are just in their comfort zone if you want to do that you should have stayed at home <laughs> please you understand what i'm saying yes. so i want you to be here not 50 percent 60 percent 100 percent can you do that? Yes. Okay, awesome. So we will welcome um, first Mr. Albert Ni Ayitego, who is the head of finance and investment, uh, finance investment and governance at GCS. Let's welcome. <laughs> and next we will welcome Mr. William Ajeman, who is the chief finance officer, CFO at Isoko. <laughs> Great, great, great. So the way we are going to do this, we're going to give each of them 10 minutes. To, I, I believe they all have some um, presentations that, that they would want to take us um, through that, whether verbal, whether slides. So we're going to hear from them. Please pick out your notes, be putting down points, even questions ahead of time, so that once they are done, we can engage them and get some real value from them. So um, we will start with Mr. Tego and um, for the sake of time, kindly tell us briefly something very brief about yourself so that our, our audience have the sense of the people that they are dealing with. Right? Right. So thank you so much <coughs> sir, for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, very um, I'm very grateful to be here. So my name is um, Albert Nia Itego. I'm, I'm grateful to my chief executive officer, Mrs. Toshibo, who has asked me to hold the phone for her for this all-important um, program. I'm very passionate about finance. Um, I head the Finance and Investment and Governance Division at the Ghana Commodity Exchange, and the passion is to be able to help um, businesses to be able to revolutionize their financial positions and also create an impact in the world. 
So um, seeing me here, I was a student leader in Valley View University also. 10 years ago. So I'm very passionate about speaking to the youth and also engaging young people because I'm also young myself. Yeah. And so I mean, we are forever young. So the passion has been there, really. I mean, so for me, this is more of a passion really than anything. And so I'm very grateful. Let, let's put our hands together. Great, you have it. Slide, slide, yes. Take it through. Okay, great. Right. So once it is. Um, maybe if, if you. Would you want to yes, stand so here? Yes, stand and then, and then the Okay, then you can. I think this, this would be a, this would be a better a place for you. Okay. okay. So, Mr. William, if you don't mind, if you can write that down. Yes. Okay, yes. And then I will take my seat here. So, is it afternoon or morning? Morning. 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 Okay. So, good morning. Good morning. So, when I had my CEO told me to do this presentation, I was like, wow, this is a good opportunity to engage with um, very important personalities and also being able to impact on I mean, the youth as we grow. So, my presentation is going to take us through a very simple process where I'll talk a bit about the Ghana Commodity Exchange and also what we do. And the most important thing for this presentation would be how are we able to plug our skills into the opportunities that exist within the commodity exchange. Ghana has always had a vision of having a commodity exchange. And in 2018, November, the commodity exchange was actually launched officially by the President, His Excellency. And also, the commodity exchange has actually started functioning, trying to structurize the agricultural value chain to bring um, a lot of value to the economy of Ghana. So we'll move, we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so this is stars from all nations. So in, in making this presentation, I mean, um, Tom said that we are gladiators. Do you believe we are gladiators? Yes. yes. Let's say we are gladiators. We are gladiators. We are gladiators. We are gladiators. Now, looking at the name, SF. A-N, span, stars from all nations. If we are gladiators, then it means that SFAN can actually own an aircraft. Is that not it? Right. Mm. Can't we own an aircraft? We can. Mm. we can. Now, look at the cockpit of the aircraft. Now, what does this? It says that we are unlocking Africa's young geniuses. That's what Tom said. It means that we are all geniuses. And if we are unlocking African CEO genius, it has to be globally around Africa. And that's what Tom mentioned. So this aircraft, Tom is going to be the chief pilot in this, and he's going to navigate all the part, what we have in the cockpit mm. to be able to fly. So we are flying. And when we are flying, it means that we are attracting all of the talent in Africa. So in fact, if you are here today, the skills that you need is actually in the name of the organization. That's from all nations. So remember that we are flying the SFAN aircraft. So we'll move to the, to the next um, slide. Now, if we are flying the SFAN aircraft, what that means is that what are the skills that you would need to be able to acquire, to be able to successfully, you know, as you're flying, you need to land. And when you are landing, it means that you are landing on an opportunity. You are landing on what? A career opportunity that is going to what? Advance whatever life's purpose and mission that you have. So then we come back to SPAN. So stars from all nations. S-FAN. S-FAN, yes. S-FAN. <laughs> it's all in. So the S is for soft skills. F, find a mentor. A, analytical mindset. N, networking. Just keep this in mind. I'm leaving you with S-FAN, knowing that all of the skills that you require is actually captured in this S fan company's name. So, in our current dispensation, soft skills cannot be overemphasized enough. And so, you ask yourself, what is the soft skill that we need? So, let's move to the next slide. So, the soft skills that we need is being open minded. So, under, under S, which is the soft skills, I have five key skills there open mindedness. How open minded are we as individuals? So, I can ask you, what do we have on the screen now? Can you tell me what we have on the screen, if somebody can help me? Somebody will say, oh, this is 39. For me, it may not be 39. It may be age of somebody. This could also mean another thing. 
to somebody depending on how the person's perception so this can this is three nine to somebody's three nine it can mean about five different things all i'm trying to say is that as you begin to position yourself to get into the corporate world or look for that you need to be able to begin to look at things from very different perspectives because the world is very dynamic so your ability to look at things from very different perspectives is what will actually put you on that edge now look at this puzzle we are not answering it but you can just think about it john wrote on friday he slept for three nights and returned on friday is this possible open-mindedness he wrote on friday he slept for three nights and then he returned on friday is this possible somebody said oh no this is not possible but it's possible depending on how you look at it somebody want to answer it we can move on just think about it so i mean looking at this from this perspective i also want to move to the next slide where we will say that emotional intelligence i can't even overemphasize this enough how did you feel when you saw this picture mm -hmm. just tell me <laughs> your emotions was already reacting okay now as you begin to get into the corporate space and look for uh, job opportunities you have to be aware of how your emotions affect people it's not more about what you know it's about how you feel around people so just know that if you have positive energy you can be a good team player you can work with people because you have to actually to achieve your objectives you must be working with people and that is what we look out for and that helps you to become a team player so if you are working with people it means that you should be able to congratulate a colleague who has done a good job mm -hmm. you should be able to pat a colleague and say good guy you contributed thank you so much if a colleague helps you you should be able to thank that person for helping you and that is the positive emotions that we are talking about so just be aware of this and know that no matter what you know technically your emotional intelligence is key and this is why i give you a quote that please move to the next slide about 20 percent of your success will actually come from your iq but 80 percent is going to come from your emotional intelligence your ability to relate and work with other people and this is what maya angelo said that what i have learned that people will forget what you said they will forget what you did but they will never forget the way you made them feel so please take note of this that one of the key soft skills is emotional intelligence so after emotional intelligence now you have to be able to learn how to communicate communication so in my simple definition i say that if you want to fit into the corporate world or even if you run your own business or no matter how high you want to go to impact lives around the world you have to be able to get feedback from what you say so you can say something but if you don't get feedback from me it means that i probably didn't understand what you said so you don't assume that whatever you say because that means something to you it means the same to the other person so until you get feedback then communication has not elapsed now look at the word that i have this is just a simple like so gift to me gift means what maybe a present that somebody has given to you but if you are working in a multinational like say like a company around the world and then you would you have a boss who is probably a german or you have a colleague who's a german gift means poison right so if you say oh i i, I want to give you a gift if you tell the person i want to give you poison <laughs> so you need to understand communication from different perspectives different languages different cultures different settings let's even look at one for us one is something like hey we have won a trophy we have won a parcel we won. all those things are there but for somebody who is probably let's say in russia one means something that is not smelling good so if you find yourself working in an institution where you have a russian and you are communicating this way it's going to create an issue so you see learn to learn and then understand these things from different perspectives different dynamics different cultures and that's actually going to help you now systems proficiency i can't even overemphasize this you need to be able to develop apps now we are moving into the more digitized world where we all talk about digitization and all of that learn it i don't need to be a computer science student and learn all the hard math like a priest <laughs> has has done to be able to develop an app i just have to get to the, to the ground and learn it i have to learn programming i want to learn it microsoft tools learn how to use powerpoint where designs learn how to design a website you see when you find yourself in an organization like the commodity exchange we emphasize on soft skills your ability to do this so when you come in all of these things will help you to be able to, to solve problems in the organization and that is what we are actually looking for 
you see and the passion is actually there to be able to raise leaders who are solving problems around the world so team building skills like i mentioned earlier is one of the skills you have to you have to be able to work with your colleagues to achieve an organizational objective so we move on to the next um the next so this actually summarizes the first point on the soft skills and this is my next point which is the f so remember that the f stands for what find a mentor please say find a mentor find a mentor how many of us i have i have mentors actually they've been so good to me how many of us have mentors please raise your hand let's see And this is where I quote my CEO. So the CEO of the Ghana Commodity Exchange is Mrs. Tuchi Ivoi, and she's running a smarter leadership program, mentoring young women around the world and young men around the world, making a lot of impact. And the point here, she has said that mentorship actually gives a mutual benefit to both the mentee and the mentor. Mm -hmm. Once you do, the, so you, the point is you don't, she says that you don't overlook that uh, benefit that you get from the mentor and mentee relationship. You understand and once you actually are able to do this right it will it will it will get you towards a very long-term value in terms of the relationships that you have and in fact the value of relationship that you have with your mentor is not something that can actually money cannot buy that there was this there's this japanese um, quotation that i always remember i said well, a one day that you spend with a mentor is worth a thousand years of diligence then because the mentor has a lot of experience to pass on to you. Yeah. I wouldn't be here talking to you if I didn't have a mentor. My mentors coached me. They guided me and told me what to do. When I need help, I get to my mentors and say, please, how can I do this? How can I do that? Mentors shape your values and make you become who you want to be. So the point is that it's a conscious skill. You need to be conscious about this and know that I need to have a mentor. If I really want to survive, it can be that you're running your business in whichever area. You need to have a mentor. So if you don't have one today, after this program, you should be able to communicate to a span that you now have a mentor. Now, number two is that he will share his practical experiences. And even now in curriculum for universities, so like Valley View University, Central University, University of Ghana, University of Cape Coast, they are running curriculum that actually have incorporated internship and mentorship programs. So when you come to the Ghana Commodity Exchange, as part of grooming staff, we have an internship program and a mentorship program, which is being led by our CEO, Mrs. Tatuchi Ivoi. You understand and that is helping to be able to raise the leaders that the exchange needs to be able to impact the, the the economy as a whole and this is a very conscious thing that we have so you can see that at, at gcx we run an internship and mentorship program for all staff it is compulsory you have to go through it to groom your skills and become better so we move on to a now a yes a is to build an analytical mindset how do you build an analytical mindset we are all looking to do things it's not even just looking for jobs but whatever you want to do you need to be able to consciously build an analytical mind and this is where i'm even more passionate about that if we look at our communication and even our reportage now there are four ways by which and that's why i'm going to teach you how to build that analytical mind i'm not just leaving you with that i have developed four steps that will help you to be able to build that analytical mind so for example you have to be descriptive in your mind diagnostic so diagnostic is telling you why 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 the third step is to be predictive what would have happened what would have happened then you move into the prescriptive state. what should happen so this is actually a first stage of building an analytical mind and i can give an example of Let's say, let's say A and B are working with the Ghana Commodity Exchange. So A comes to report that the laptop is, oh, hello, please, the laptop is uh, broken, or maybe the printer is broken. Maybe the, the lights just went off. It ends there. If you look at some of our communications and all that, okay, so what happens? So it means that you have actually only done two steps of the analytical mind. Mm -hmm. You've only, you've, you've just done two steps. Most of us would not move to the predictive and then the prescriptive stage. So it is today that we have to learn. You see, so if A comes and ends there, then B was hired the next day. Now B comes, oh please, the, 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 the machine is broken. It was because of the uh, maybe poor lights or the poor networking and all that, which, is, which has caused that. 
I also think that this could have caused the whole building to have run into a fire situation or it could have caused the whole building to lose a certain... And so, what we should do, A, B, C, D, which of the two would you say have done very well? Tell me. The second person. The reason being that he or she has been able to go through the four stages of building that analytical mind. And whatever the person is saying is very clear. Coming through descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. So, this is what I leave with you. Let's learn how to build an analytical mind. In all, and what it helps you to do, it helps you to be creative, it helps you to bring more ideas, and it helps you to solve problems. Okay, so we can move on to N, network, network, network. You must always learn to develop your network. So you can see we most of the time when we talk about network, we only talk about computers. But as human beings, we have to connect. And when uh, t uh, t uh, thing was taking us through the connection, we could feel that we are all interconnected. So how are you connecting? And so we have to even thank uh, Espan uh, for putting this program. So you attend seminars and conferences. Get to know people. I mean, meet somebody, take the person, oh, hi, I'm this, I'm that. I mean, that is how the world is built. Attend internship forums. Attend career development programs, join virtual meetings, get to know somebody through networking. And I can tell you that this can make a lot of difference in the, the, the job search and the build the, the skills that we are actually looking to build for the next future. So the, the point the point here is that what what do we do at the um, commodity exchange? So I mentioned that in 2018. The government of Ghana set up the commodity exchange. So now we are a regulated market that connects buyers and sellers of agricultural commodities together to trade under rules. So when there are rules, it means that it comes with standardization. And once you standardize the trade of commodities within the agricultural sector, what it does is that it assures you of quality, quantity, competitive prices. And then you know that your trades are going to be settled in a timely manner. So all of these problems that are existing within the agricultural value chain is being structured by the existence of a commodity exchange. You understand? So coming here, I've always had the opportunity to speak to people and I always tell them that we always want to build our careers. But this is the time that the exchange has also brought up another career opportunity for a lot of us to begin to look and see how our skills would fit. So you, you remember all the s that we've talked about. You remember the skills that are needed to be able to navigate the corporate world, even if you're running your own business. These are key skills you still look out for. Now, let's move to the next slide and see that if this is what the exchange is doing, we will now try and understand what the commodity exchange does in terms of its ecosystem. So look at the commodity, commodity exchange. So we are going to relate this. It's an exercise we are going to do. Every area, you tell me the job opportunities that you see. Once you understand what the commodity exchange does, you will be able to tell me the opportunities that exist. So you bring your commodity. So we, it starts from the farm gate, where the farmer have So we trade in rice, soya, sorghum, sesame. Recently, we are doing auction for cashew and all of that. Now, look at the opportunities that exist. Ghana having a commodity exchange, which is creating that structure that is needed in the agricultural sector. And think about this. 20% of the GDP of Ghana is actually contributed by the agricultural sector. And this sector is actually employing 35% of the population of the workforce in Ghana. So having this, it means that the impact is really huge. So look at the, the farm. So at the farm gate, who are we creating em em employment for? So the farmer is able to aggregate his commodities. He brings it to, to what, our warehouses. So here, you have what we call farmer support officers. So those who have done probably agriculture, who understands the value chain, okay, the value chain te te techniques and all of that would be able to help. Then there's logistical opportunities. You are moving your commodities to the warehouse. So you need what? Drivers, you need uh, which other people? Tell me. All of those people will be what? Sorry? Companies that sell. Companies that, all those are opportunities. Yeah. Now you move the commodities to the warehouse. So in the warehouse, we do grading, testing, weighing. These are all quality control things. Checking sure that the maize, or the soya that you have is of quality. It means that you need what quality control officers, mm -hmm. you need extension officers, you need warehouse managers, mm -hmm. you need so many job opportunities in there. Now, from there, now we generate what we call the GRN. The GRN is actually traded on the central depository. Now, if you generate, it means that there's some IT system efficiency that is needed there, right? Mm -hmm. Then the central depository is also 
created. Also, IT, you need a central depository head, you need central depository officers who actually, that's where the trade actually uh, 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 first is executed before it moves to the trading floor. So once it moves to the trading floor, it means that you would need different people. So you need a trading manager, you would need trading officers. And so these are all career opportunities. Mm -hmm. Then from there, the, from the way the exchange works, you need to have a partner bank, which is a settlement bank. So that is where, you see, when you are trading, you put your money in, a, in, in one bank, and then the, fund, the funds is transferred to the other party in the other bank. So you need banks. So there will be bankers, there will be financial advisors, mm -hmm. and all of that. And then the cash is actually uh, settled among the two parties. And then trade is actually done. Delivery is done to whoever bought the commodities. Now, I'm saying all of this to move to the next slide to say that once you understand what we do, it will tell you the opportunities that exist within the exchange that you can actually leverage on. So we can move to the next slide, which is actually my... Uh, so, like I mentioned, this is just a snapshot of the things that you need. So you need a research and policy analyst. You need risk specialist. You need quality control specialist. You need agribusiness experts. You need agrofinance experts. You need internal control compliance experts. You need alternative dispute resolution experts within the exchange. So these are all career opportunities. Let's move. So it's, it's more. Legal experts. When there's, when there's a legal issue for a trade, we need legal experts to help. We need relationship officers in all areas. We need communication experts. We need IT experts. Data analytics. Clearing and settlement specialists. Trading specialists. Brokers. Brokers represent other members on the exchange to be able to facilitate trade. So you need brokers. We would also need, so we move on. So these are all career opportunities. You need chartered accountants with the finance department. You need economists. You need financial analysts. You need commodity pricing data analysts. You need human resource experts who are going to handle the, I think we have a human resource um, a professional here. So these are all opportunities that exist within the exchange. We need value chain analysts. And when you look at the ecosystem of GCX, you realize that I showed you that in the, in the warehouse, there are quality control processes that happen. That is where you need value chain analysis. And so for every commodity that you list, you have to be able to understand what the value chain issues are, and then that is actually executed. So that's where the value chain, and then the warehouse and experts also comes in to be able to help um, conclude on all of this. So um, I think my mandate here is done. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much. That was amazing. That was amazing. So we will come. Oh, please. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We will come back to. We'll, we'll spend more time with them. We'll ask them more questions mm -hmm. during the panel um, session. Okay. And so at this point, we will welcome uh, Mr. William, who is from Isoko. Um, while said you have a slide. No. Okay, yeah. fine. That's fine. That's fine. Right. So let's welcome Mr. William Adiman to also give us his presentation, and then from there we'll move on. Let's put our hands together. For him? No, for you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, the seminar that we are having on the conference that we are having, are we going to be in the form of a WhatsApp so that whatever that the presentations that they are giving us, we can have a gist of it. Okay, so that 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 will be sorted. So that will be sorted out easily. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that can be sorted out. Um, so you can see the organizers or the tech guys, mm -hmm. and they will sort that out. So let's put our hands together. Again. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm, like you said, I'm also stepping in for my CEO. Uh, I got a call just last night to mm -hmm. represent him. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. So. Uh, which is why I don't have a presentation, but we must make sure we're going to have. So I'll quickly, uh, I think initially, said we can introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about ourselves. And now will speak about our company, Soko, and uh, what you know, job opportunities are there for you uh, in terms of, I think most of you are, I think, young men and women, and uh, you may already be in employment or searching for employment and all that. So my, my name is William Osei Ajemai. Uh, I joined Isoko some 13 years ago. Wow. 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 Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, I always say this to, as it were, inspire people, you know, especially when you are entering the job market, especially after school or when you are jumping from one work to the other. 
when I joined the school, I was very young. I had just completed first degree from the University of Cape Coast. You know, I was clueless about, you know, you know employment. Uh, I had an interview, you know, I got a call to come for interview because I was just applying. You know, when you finish school, you keep applying. <laughs> so I was called for the interview and, uh, yes, I was interviewed by a white guy and uh, he said, okay, so we are recruiting you as a, a administrator. Ad, ad, ad me assistant and finance something something so you know i mean from school i thought that when once you get there it's just like go and photocopy this mm -hmm. go and do this and, that, <laughs> and you know stuff like that so i i i go to the office on on the monday and you know the ceo at the time was like okay so we are we are uh, expecting some investors from the world bank and they are coming in on wednesday so prepare Kai. You see, so it's a huge challenge, and uh, at that time, if you are not careful, you you even resign because you know what are you going to say? So you have to sit, and now we have the benefit of the internet. You understand? You know, so you have to sit, you have to look at how you know balance sheet and cash flows and things are run, and you know P and L. Those things we've learned them theoretically at school. You know, so you have to sit and. and so when they came in, we had a meeting. I was only giving first, I was giving three months contract, you know, just so you prove yourself. So after that meeting, so this was a Monday, on Wednesday, Wednesday afterwards, my contract was extended to six months, wow. you know, and uh, we've, we've gone through the ranks and, you know, Isoko, uh, it's not only a Ghanaian company, we have a parent company based in Mauritius, we have a branch in Kenya and in Tanzania, and through partnership, we are in about 20 countries. And, you know, so for the start of 13 years, I'm now the group CFO. Wow. wow. So, it, it tells you how you, as a young man, you know, entering into the job market, you know, in as much as our motivation should be money and all that, you also have to aspire, you know, to, to make yourself, in a way, inevitable for the company. You know, so now to Isoko. Isoko, what Isoko, Isoko actually does? is uh, when we first started, we were very much tilted to the agri sector. So what we realized was that uh, we have farmers mostly based in the hinterlands. They have no clue how much commodities are selling in various markets in the big cities. So typically, uh, you have a, a, a maize farmer in say 30 man. Somebody from Accra goes there and buy the, a bag of maize, maybe 30 cities, maybe 100 cities, and come to sell it you know, twice the price. Because the farmer is clueless and is not aware how much is selling in Accra, he has no bargaining power. So what we did was to digitize market prices. So we collect market prices, digitize them and send them via SMS to the farmers. Mm. So every Wednesday, Wednesday, for example, the farmer in Tetima knows that Isoko is sending me how much my bag of maize sells. So once the market man or the market man comes to the farmer, he knows that, you know, he's selling 200 cities in Accra, so I can't sell to you 80 cities, you know. So this is how it's supposed to start. Then we have to recruit people, positioning them in all these about 48 markets across the country to collect prices. So that is the first uh, leg of employment we created <coughs> by placing people in this market. Okay. So now you come to other aspect of our, you know, I mean, in progressing, progressing, we also veered into other areas like large data collection. You know, so we we help government and big institutions to collect data. So if you've heard about government program like the LEAP program, the Ghana National House of Registry, so it's also the technology and the deployment company behind those programs. So uh, in, in, in the past, government will send people to villages, you know, to use pen and paper to collect data from, you know, rural areas. Once they are in transmission, there are, you know, a lot of errors. So we use technology to send people to these hinterlands to use our uh, application to collect data. And it's transmitted, it can be offline, online, transmitted to our servers and real time it goes to the ministry. So with this aspect of our work, 
on an annual basis because I think this this contract comes and we sometimes twice a year, once a year, and we employ thousands and thousands of people to deploy them across the country to collect this. So that is some of the uh, one aspects of Isoko's employment opportunities that we create. So these are temporal employment, you know, putting people in the various market to collect data and also deploying people across the country to collect big data for us. Now when we come to um, permanent work for ISOPO, you know, as I said, you know, there are, there are different departments uh, in ISOPO. We, we have a corporate department, for example, where, you know, we have people from different backgrounds, business administration, finance, accounting, and stuff like that, that you can, you can work in ISOPO. We, we also do have, I mean, the IT department, and this is kind of the backbone of ISOPO because all our work is, uh, depends on, you know, technology. technology. So we have a lot of IT staff, you know, software developers, uh, you know, I'm sure you know, I mean, it's most of the, uh, networking stuff like that. So that is one area that is also quite difficult to find people to employ. You know, because you know the employment market is very competitive in that area. You have the big telcos and the big also chasing the same people. And that what we do is that we go to the universities to meet the final year students, encourage them to you know come and offer their national service at Isoko and from there we can you know employ you. So uh, I'll say this, currently with Isoko, uh, the jobs that are available that, you know, any of you here could, you know, could apply. You know, we have the, uh, we have computer science students, mostly programs, database management, networking systems, mobile applications, and we have data science and software designs, uh, geo-information sciences. Then we have, uh, under our products, too, we have, uh, I think, communication, software, and product designs. So those are the ones that are available. Then I think subsequent to this meeting, you can follow up and uh, we'll see what your skill sets are. You know, but beyond that, we do have, you know, different partnership that comes in, you know, every now and then. We will put, we not necessarily, uh, you know, the IT section, but it can be other areas. You know, if you have an agreed background, if you did any, any background, you can, you know, link up with us and when the opportunity presents itself, why not? We're going to, having this interaction, maybe you're going to have some priority, you know, from this program that you attended. So, um, we, I would, I will stop there. If like any questions, then we will we'll take them as as they come. Awesome, awesome. Let's do some love. Let's put that together for them one more time. Okay, great. So we will zoom in straight um, to the panel discussion session. I don't know if Mr. Table can join oh, okay, yeah. closely so that. Yeah, I uh, take some attention from me, small. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So uh, we have some minutes, I think some 15 to 20 minutes um, to do this. First, Mr. Albert True, um, Mr. Table True More Life on what they are doing at the uh, GCX. Um, yes. yes. And um, he went ahead to also, I mean, I mean he gave us the. SFAN acronym he went ahead to also give us some opportunities available at, at the organization. So I don't know, does anyone have a question when he was given his presentation? Maybe he said something that you would want more, you know, like to be drawn on or any random question at all. Yes, sir. So you tell us your first name. Yeah, I'm Michael. Um, I want to know. With opportunities available, the right. both the both uh, organizations, uh, do you have to specifically have a certificate or a qualification in that particular thing? Because you are mentioning data specialists, a whole lot of uh, opportunities. So I was asking before somebody can make a move or trying to apply, do you have to get uh, a particular qualification in in, in, in those things? 
or if the person is a graduate, you, you can mentor the person, you can help the person out or something. Uh, I want to know. Okay. Please, would you want to take the questions one after the other, or do you want to take a couple of questions? I think um, one after the one other. I think um, specifically, um, if you look at, for example, at the commodity exchange, we have about 13 departments. So let's take a department like finance, investment, and governance. You definitely need to have a technical qualification. For example, you should have had some professional qualifications and all of that. That becomes like a fundamental um, certificate that you need. But beyond that, there are other areas. So for example, if you look at value chains and product development, you need to have done some agribusiness. You need to have some good understanding of the value chain. So that's also very key. But there are some general rules, like IT, you still need to have some basic IT and all of that. But some general rules within the organization that you can actually come in and learn, depending on your passion and what, where you really want to fit in. So to a large extent, it really depends on you as an individual and what you are really looking out to achieve for yourself. Because for me, when I started my career, I knew that I wanted to be in this um, financial space. So quickly after university, I started um, with my charter program, the Challenge of Managers Accountants. Knowing that that is the basic qualification I know to be able to find myself in a certain position. The other things would be the soft skills that we mentioned. You have to be able to know how to work with people. You have to be able to communicate properly. You would have to be able to build your confidence. You have to be able to connect. You see, so these are the soft skills that will help you to write. So at least as much as possible, have that basic, depending on your career pro progression, have that basic uh, qualification that you actually need. And then use that as the stepping stone to be able to connect but there are some other rules that you don't necessarily you may have done for example if you have to like becoming an analyst or a commodity analyst you don't need to have done probably you need uh, probably uh, you could have done economics uh, mathematics or business administration you can even could have done psychology from Legon but you can still actually engage yourself by learning on the job you learn how to analyze data you learn how to be able to do projections even Excel you don't need to be a mathematician before you use Excel it's right. now a basic tool that you need so learn, learn, learn as much as you can. Learn the Excel, learn any Microsoft tools that you need to use all the beyond your, your, your technical um, competence. And that's really what's going to put you out there. So that even in the future, you find yourself running an organization, you also know what to look out for in other people and also help to bring up other people. And all of that. Okay, it. thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much for that. And um, just a follow-up, do you have a, vac a vacancy page somewhere online that if people want to go and read more? Yes, yeah, so you can go to our website. It's okay. not a vacancy page, but um, you just go to our website. So you can read more about the organization. Okay. And okay. if you are interested, you go through there's an application process we've put out there. Okay. And then you just follow the process and uh, the right you know, processes will be executed to get okay. to you. Yes. Awesome, awesome. So... Please, I hope your question has been answered. Yes, sir. I'm um, Kusi. Right. Yeah. So please, you don't have to only uh, throw <laughs> all the questions to okay. him. We heard okay. start your okay. on as well. So. Uh, you mentioned, we were looking at the expand, and you mentioned one item, find a mentor. Yes. What are the characteristics, characteristics of a good mentor? What okay. are some of them? Right. Do you have a mentor? The name again? Kusi, Kusi, do you have a mentor? No, please. Have you ever thought of having a mentor? Yes, please. So why haven't you had a mentor as of now? I haven't got the good features of a mentor. Oh. That I <laughs> what, what's your career object? So usually that's that's how I approach it. You see, you need to know what you really want to achieve. I mean, in life, basically, in terms of your career, once you identify that objective. It directs you to the kind of mentor that you actually, because in every area, there are different kinds of mentors that you actually can look out for. So I'll first advise you to look out for that objective. Once you find that objective, then you can use that as an opportunity to now figure out who is actually making an impact or influence in the area that you're actually looking at. Then you can actually look at some, a mentor would usually grow in you. So mentorship, like I mentioned, mentorship, I mean, you have the, passion to be able to have that time and have some discussions with you and like I use for the Japanese uh, program, if you spend one day with your mentor there's a lot of experience that you, you have gotten so a mentor will groom you he will grow you he will guide you and share his experiences with you so that you become a better version of yourself in terms of what you really want to do so um, reason the reason why I'm even saying this is that if you look at some of the uh, international organizations that's why I mentioned that at DCX we have a conscious program for mentorship 
spent internship program, which is led by the chief executive, this is uh, city chief, mm -hmm. whom you understand. Uh, so these are conscious things that have been done, even in schools, like I mentioned, we have all the universities running mentorship program, but that's the path that would actually help you to be able to create that uh, prosperity that you're uh, uh, looking for and the guidance that you need. So set out these objectives and then look out for these tenets of a mentor being affable and helping you to grow and having that time to be able to. And then you also have that humility to learn. Very, very important. Right, right. Great. Please, any, any more questions? Yes, and then we'll come to you. To continue to what you said. I'm out there. I'll be. Okay. 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 best practices in terms of approaching the person to ask him to be a mentor. Do I take that one? That question? Is it directed at me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> yes, uh, the best practice, so if you look at the S fan skill that we talk, it's all about interpersonal. You need to be able to have that interpersonal relationship. So have some respect for your mentor. Just the general courtesies that needs to be extended to. So you can approach the person politely and say that my name is this, I'll, I'll be following your. There's a book that I read that has really changed my life a lot. That's um, by Dale Carnegie, that's like 10 years ago. How to win friends and influence people. You can, you can get that book and see how that can shift. You can even guide you in terms of how you can relate with people, how you can seek the best interest for people and just generally improving your interpersonal relationships with people. I mean, that's how you actually relate with uh, your mentor. So try and read that and then I mean, open up yourself. And I'm sure that there are great uh, opportunities that will come. Read also, the title again, the title of the book. It's How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Okay. Yes, I read that book about 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah. wow. Please, um, uh, just so you know, we are, we are live streaming this event. So if you're speaking, out there please project your voice for us okay. and our speakers as well let's project so that okay. those watching from wherever they are watching from will also appreciate this so thank you for your question you raised your yeah so i'm robert yes i'm robert i wanted to um ask the same question what is the best um approach to get a mentor that um, you want right um personally i have um Mentors, that's local ones and in stages. Stages, right? Yeah, I'm a developer. Okay. So in case I'm developing something and I'm stuck somewhere, quickly I call them because they have already passed through that. Stage, they give me yeah. the solution. Then move on. What but, do you develop? Um, in, I'm into websites. Mm, okay. Yeah, web applications. Let me put it down. Web apps. Okay, so. Um, I'm targeting some mentors at uh, Microsoft and Amazon, yes. who are all Ghanaians. Okay. Yes. I don't want to mention it, but um, <laughs> I, I think one of them um, wants to make it as if I'm like I'm applying for a job. So I don't know how best I can get him. So let me come in yes. a bit. So we like as in Isoko, we have some of our software developer leaving Isoko to Amazon, for example. And uh, uh, I don't know if you are doing something privately or you are attached to you know a company, so to speak, because uh, some of these areas it's always good to have that sharing experience. Yeah. You know, when you sit in your own corner and try to do your own something, sometimes you are a bit inhibited in terms of your exposure. You know, when you, I think that, uh, that is what I was asking what you develop and what you do, maybe I have to know more about. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, if you, for example, you work for Isoko, for example, you know, you have experienced developers, sometimes we bring in people from, you know, different countries to come and, you know, pass on their knowledge to you and all, to make you an international developer, yeah. you understand? Yeah. So I think that uh, in finding your mentor, you also have to look at the, you know, prospect of you know attaching yourself to a company. You can do your own. I mean, your software developers. You know, you don't sleep. You, you, you know, you always work in you know building apps here and there. But if you have a structured company that you are affiliated with, you understand. Then you have that level of exposure. You know, because like I said earlier, we have people leaving our office or our company to Amazon and uh, you know Google and all that. So for you, for example. Awesome. So he's the first.
Spencer, you have to speak with <laughs> when the events close. And and please, um, just to add up, you know, if before you even approach a mentor, you know, you also want to carry a, sen- a, a sense of perspective, uh, not perspective, but outlook. When a mentor sees you, what does he see? Mm-hmm. In fact, where are you guys even communicating? Right. Is he on LinkedIn? Is he on Facebook? Where your picture on Facebook? You've done some nigger sign, you know, all, the, <laughs> all, all, all those things. So yeah, the yeah, outlook yeah. is also very yeah. important, and you want to give a, a good first impression. Right. Like he said, even before you attach yourself to an organization, maybe you can create uh, a link tree. Is he a link tree? Um, they have this platform where you can put all your useful links mm-hmm. for people to, to visit. You mm-hmm. can drop your portfolios mm-hmm. over there. Dear sir, this is what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking for a mentor. The, the outlook is very important. Yes. Right. Yeah, so we look at that as well. Let's take the lady and then we'll come to you. Okay. Please, when you were uh, talking, you, you started with uh, Safran. You said soft skills. Uh, I want to know, in HR, we have hard skills and soft skills, but those one, you may mention of the soft skills. I want to know, to know uh, what the soft skills you are talking about. Okay, um, like you rightly said, so in HR, we have soft skills and hard skills. And um, one of the things that I want to share is that, depending on the role that is available in an organization, so for example, let's take an community. If there's a role available, you would... I mean, from the HR perspective, you first look for some basic technical competences. So if you're looking for an IT expert, for example, you should have done some basic IT and all of that. That's, that's one of the hard skills that you would require for such a role. But then again, if you, if, if you watch the, on the s presentation, I made emphasis on the fact that 80% of your success, for example, in an interview or the job, relies on your soft skills. So it doesn't mean you won't have the hard skills, but to be able to, so if there's an opportunity between A and B, both are technically qualified, you both have the same qualification. The only difference between A and B would be how A carries himself differently from B. And that's where the soft skills actually comes in. So if, if that's why most of the times, for example, and I've been on panels where we've asked questions around, how would you react in a situation like this? Now, asking such a question, sometimes you would have to be able to demonstrate how your reaction. So it means that we are triggering that soft skill aspect of you to be able to see how you. Because sometimes on the job, we can ask you, how do you manage pressure? And you'll be like, oh, I can manage. But when you get on the job and there's pressure, then you are not able to manage your emotions very well. You begin to displace yourself and all that. And, oh, I thought you said you'd be able to manage pressure when we're asking you this question. At the end. So that's what we want to bring out of you because that's what will build that resistance, you see, uh, to be able to. So usually, I actually advise that if. You, you go for an interview and you are asked, for example, a behavioral question. Question that is, how will you react under stress? Or tell us something that you've done under this situation. I use an approach which I call the car approach. You see, you can just say it plainly in context. Oh, this is what I did. But you have to build it in a certain criteria. So, for example, put the situation in context. So, I, use, I, I name it car. So, the situation is, okay, in context, this is what I did when I was under pressure. But the A in that tells you what are the specific actions that you took. You got you got it. Yeah. It's not enough telling me what the context of the situation is. No. But, okay, so when I was placed under this situation, I was able to do A, B, and that is where the meat of the situation is. Oh, okay, so this person can actually react in this situation. And then the R, you don't end there. The R itself now becomes the results. Mm-hmm. So what did you achieve after that situation? Mm-hmm. So you have the car. So even though we've asked you a question under... How would you behave when you are under pressure? You've been able to give us a contextual perspective. You've been able to give us the specific actions that you took. And then what results did it actually achieve? I mean, if you are able to give something like this, it's going to be very fantastic. So I think we can keep that in perspective. You love the job. Right? That, is, that is awesome. Um, with, with respect, I, I actually wanted right. to ask okay. when you spoke about soft skills. So just so we... I mean, this is a practical event. Right. I would give us an assignment. When you go home, mm-hmm. please list down the soft skills that you believe you possess in their context. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then do a hyphen 
and write the action that proves that you have that soft <laughs> skill. Yeah. Is that a good exercise? Yeah, it's a good exercise. Really. Yes. yes, and then the results. Please, the let's, results. let's be practical. Yes. But the first is very, very important. Identify yourself. What are my soft skills? Is it communication? Is it open-mindedness? And then the second, I mean, the main question to you, sir, is that how do we even develop these soft skills in the first place? Right. Should I go to Google, hey, Google, what are the 21st century soft skills? Right. And then start, you know, learning them. Yeah. What do we do? Uh, I think so you have to be conscious about it. So when you wake up in the morning, you want to tell yourself that you want to be a good communicator. So how do you do that? get the answer for yourself you also want to say that okay i want to be open-minded how do i look at things from different perspectives so in your daily actions you can be presented with an issue so for example there was this um, puzzle that, uh, it, that john wrote on friday mm-hmm. he slept for three nights and returned on friday is, is is it possible i don't know if i will still have an answer you wrote you you you, you wrote on friday mm-hmm. you slept for three nights and then you return on Friday. Now, I think we should throw it. To okay, so I'm throwing it. If, if, we, if we can have answers, you see. Now, if you tell me that this is not possible, then I'll be like, okay, so probably you are not trying to help yourself to think, at, look at things from different perspectives. Yes. But yes. once you trigger that possibility, so that you see, the mind works like a magnet, like the exercise we're doing here. So you need to trigger the mind and find out. How so is this possible? Yes, it's possible. Once you trigger the mind, what you go, but when you tell the mind it's not possible, it shuts down automatically. Mm-hmm. It's not going to think. But once you say, oh, it's possible, then you begin to look at all the variables and all the possibilities. He slept for, he, he yeah. rode on Friday, slept yes. for three nights, and returned on Friday. Friday. How come? You see, so in answering this, we can see that maybe part of our world, we've known Friday to be probably a day of the week. And because of that, that's what we keep in our minds. So Friday is just the day of the week. But in this context, if you open up your mind, you would realize that, no, it's possible because Friday is probably a horse. That is what makes it possible. Or Friday is probably a car. Or a ship. Or it's a ship. (laughs) (laughs) So once you open up your mind, you're like, okay, so I've been told that Friday is just the day of the week, but it's not just that Friday can mean other things that could enhance mobility mm-hmm. and that is what can make that context of the puzzle what's mm-hmm. possible so when you are faced with a situation at work you do the same thing you ask yourself okay so the, 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 the IT system has shut down this is what has happened what are the other possibilities of solving this problem so it's a conscious thing if you ask me it's a knowing exactly how you want to develop yourself it's a conscious thing and learning that to develop it on daily basis Facing situations and okay, I want to be open minded. I have to learn how to communicate. I want to learn how to relate with people. I want to. It's all depends on you and how you consciously do that. Working even as part of a team. How do you become even a good team player? How do I encourage my other team members to do very well? Do I always want the glory for myself or I don't acknowledge other people's mm. hard work? You have to consciously do that. Mm. You see, so that's 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 really you know, how. Also ask yeah. to it. Uh, I mean, those of us who work in the finance department and HR department, for example, you are you are almost always privy to every kind of information in the company. Mm-hmm. Now, people come to this department, you know, like I always tell my guys, I say, this is the most depressing department to work in mm-hmm. because maybe this guy came to the came to the company, you know, just like last week because he's a software developer, he's earning X amount. Right. Then you have been there as a finance officer and then why a month, which is lower than what is earning. Once you are depressed by that information, <laughs> then you are not fit to work in that department. You know, and once you are also depressed about that information, then the tendency that you will discuss other guys' yeah, salary yeah, with yeah. people is high. Right. So your ability to also keep confidential information. I mean working in this kind of you know department, you know, like you have an HR person here. You know, it's, it's also probably part of the soft skill that you have to actually assume or develop when you are working it, and so that your bosses can trust you. Right. You know, so when you start running around with people's salary information, then right. it means your days in the company will be numbered. Mm-hmm. I want to give a, a typical example. There was this project that I supervised some time ago, mm-hmm. and they happened. So we put the people in groups of four in different regions. There happened to be one lady amongst the team that, in fact, when they came back, they were together for like 
two to three months when yeah, they came right. back we had to set up you know a court of inquiry yeah, because yeah. The people were fighting among themselves but there happened to be one particular lady within a team who would go and talk uh, uh, to this person gather information go and tell the other nice. i mean it was it was just bad and yeah. everyone was came back with the same feedback mm-hmm. so that means that not it's not just one person trying to target yeah. you yeah. you know and what we noticed was that when they finished no one said a good thing about the lady mm-hmm. until now mm-hmm. i mean that company sends out people and recruits people every uh, now and then mm-hmm. till now they have not called her back yeah one time she called me and said i should go and plead with the people mm-hmm. she she has changed she's sorry so i'm just trying to say that you know these things that he's speaking about they are abstract yeah. but they are attitudes yeah. that we we you, we know ourselves you know yourself yeah. if you think there is a certain attitude a certain character um that would not bring value to a company you are targeting you want yeah. to start working on it now people leave the company years and uh, you know they are applying for sometimes very sensitive positions mm. I, I said i've been around for like 30 years so people we started you know left like 10 years ago mm. And you got calls from national security asking that mm. you know this person is buying or applying for this position and want to come and see you to, because he's wow. as his, in his CV he's mentioned Isoko. Mm. You know, so how you even exit companies that you mm. have worked in for is very important. Mm. You know, even if there is some kind of acrimony, you have to be very professional and exit in a way that will not create that kind of acrimony before you exit. The company is very important. One man once said, close the doors well. Yeah. <laughs> great, great, great. So, yes, let's take yeah, yeah, this. Let's uh, quick one uh, on mentorship. I want to know, do, 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 should, it, should, should your mentor be older than you? <laughs> the other one too is that. I have tried... Uh, trying to like talk over with some people as uh, my mentor but they uh, uh, want to do me right but you a little big than me how can how can yeah. i be your mentor you see so yeah. at, at, at times it, does it happen whereby i come like i want you to be my mentor and it's like i even look bigger than you i even look uh, like uh, so the mentor here in court looks intimid- intimidated in a way yes uh-huh. so i want to know if there is age limit uh, or something yeah okay well from my perspective i don't think that age limits i mean uh, mentorship is usually if you look at if you look at the presentation that uh, i have actually done so you can be the youngest guy but the fact that you've led that road and you can lead other people it's fine you qualify to be a mentor to be able to help other people so age should not really be a factor at all there are instances where you would have um, older people who have had that very long experience and it fits into your uh, mentorship criteria that is also there but apart from that i mean anybody could be a mentor once the person has walked that road has gathered that experience and it's, it's, it's And one thing I even want to highlight is that mentorship should not be like uh, just uh, maybe one at every level of your life, at every level of your stage, you would need a mentor to guide you. So, for example, if you are in school, there are some mentorship that you would need to be able to complete your first degree. If you are probably pursuing a professional qualification, you would need some mentorship. So, at every level, even if you are married, in, in different aspects of life, you would still need a mentor to be able to guide you. So, look at it from once again, an open-mindedness perspective, okay? And look at it from different perspectives. So, okay, so at every point in my life, I would need a mentor to be able to hold me. So sometimes the experience that is being going to share with you would help you to be able to even, if not mitigate, manage a situation you might have faced in the future and all of that. So don't look at the age at all. Just look at the experience. And then I think it should, it should, it should suffice. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Please, if you're enjoying this, like, uh, I am as join. I want you to put your hands together. So, uh, and while the 
session was ongoing, a very important gentleman joined us. Wow. You know, we have the program's director um, at Mest Africa. Great. You know, uh, Mr. Femi Adewumi. Wow. Uh, you know, so, like, we gave every speaker the opportunity to, you know, give us some brief presentation. I don't know if Mr. Mr. Um, um, Femi will do that for, for, for us. Let's, let's welcome um, him with a clap. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. I apologize for coming in so late. I did not anticipate the traffic. <laughs> yes. Um, so, MEST, uh, as many people may already know, has been in Ghana now since 20, 2008. Um, and the idea behind MEST was we have a, a founder who himself is a software entrepreneur who started a business um, uh, building software. He himself comes from similar backgrounds like some of us and they started a business building software, which has grown, you know, to be represented in over 56 countries globally. Um, he started out of Norway, moved into the US, and um, the rest is history. And he feels that, um, yes, from his own background, he sees that everybody, regardless of where you're from in, in the world, you have talent, you have capacity, but the opportunity is not that um, prevalent. So he decided to create that opportunity for um, people in developing uh, 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 um, economies like Africa. And then came hunting for a place to build his vision. And of course, he landed in, in Ghana. And in 2008, MES was born in Ghana. Um, MES, over the years, has trained several entrepreneurs. The flagship of MES program is what we call the training program, where we bring, in we bring in interested people in entrepreneurship from all over Africa, bring them into Accra in a fully funded one year program where they are trained to become entrepreneurs and they graduate with uh, other members, um, uh, sorry, in the process they form teams and build businesses. And at the end of the day, they paid for funding from, from MES. Some of them got, get funded, some do get funded. Those that get funded get taken into our incubator for another 18 months. So one year plus 18, 18 months to take their product to the market. Those that get don't get funded from experience because of the depth and the quality of the training that they get, easily get employment in other places. Um, many companies boast that they, they've taken MEST alumni as, as their staff. Now, in 2019, um, MEST and MasterCard came together and decided to expand the impact of mests of mests in Ghana. Um, just to give you some perspective, every year the total number of entrepreneurs we train, max max, is 60. Wow. From different countries, of course, but no more than 60. And um, we've done this consistently for like 12 years. Wow. But Mastercard feels and Mess feel that it's time to expand this impact. So they came together in 2019 and created three new programs um, called Pre-MEST, MEST Express, and MEST Skill. Um, MEST Skill is targeted at late stage um, MSMEs um, who have proven traction, they've been doing business for a while, but they don't know what to do to scale. And maybe we feel technology will help them to be able to scale their businesses um, either locally or even internationally. And so this is what MEST Skill is for. MEST Express is for early stage startups They've already created their business. They are, they are already showing some revenue. There's some uh, loyal users, but they don't know what to do. They've not gone through any formal training on how to um, uh, build their business and make it grow, get sustainable growth. So Mess Express takes these ones in and helps them. But pre mess is probably what you're all more interested in um, because pre mess is targeted at young residents of Ghana who um, either are unemployed or maybe employed and want to um, build, uh, create, uh, become entrepreneurs. So um, we have two tracks here, the skills track where we train people in software development and in digital marketing. 
and the end of it is to help them get employment. Um, this program started in 2020, um, September. Between then and now, we have graduated roughly 180 people in digital marketing and in software development. Um, out of this 180, roughly 40 of them already had jobs. Wow. But between then and now, we've been able to get about 43 of them in jobs. Um, and we don't just talk about jobs, we talk about jobs that are, um, uh, that, that, that make you happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, we recently graduated another set of uh, 70 from three partners across wow. Ghana in Wa, in wow. uh, Bulga, wow. and in Kumasi. Wow. And now we're in the process of getting jobs for this. In fact, from the interest, the expression of interest that we put out, we already have about 45 jobs confirmed. Wow. wow. Sorry, 45 internships wow. of three months that we are funding. Yeah. Um, because we also believe that it is not enough to train people in a class. We should give them actual job experience. Yeah. From our growth in the industry, we found out that it's, it's the um, experience that you have that people pay for. Yeah. So we just said, let's go one step further, pay for the internship, help them go into a work environment after learning the skill, practice it, practice engaging with people, practice relating with people, practice you know, coming for meetings, taking meeting notes, collaborating with other people, you know, for software developers, putting your project in GitHub and collaborating with other people. For digital marketers, you know, create a, a portfolio of projects that you can show that I have done something and then you can use, you can use to get proper um, long-term employment. So this is what we've done um, so far from a pre nest um, uh, from well, a general MEST and then MEST MasterCard uh, project. Uh, thank you very much. I'm hoping to see the question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Femi has come to add more flavor yeah, you know, to, 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 to the panel and I'm loving it. I'm loving it. The, the work and impact of MEST has been impressive. So please, uh, we have just some few more minutes to go. Let us now throw our questions to um, the, three, the, the, the three of, of our speakers over here. Your question, uh, please. Can I see by hand, because of the time we have, can I see by hand anyone who has a question? No, I refuse to believe it's just two people. <laughs> no lady. Madam, you've not spoken the whole day. Okay, let's take from these two gentlemen and then we'll see if there's more time. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Just like the others, precise, accurate, and on the points. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, I want to know, you said young. Young, yeah. Uh, what, do you have an age? Uh, because the, the previous thing you're talking about, in fact, uh, me, I think I would even love to. <laughs> but you're talking about young, yeah. I'm a young man in a way, but I don't know, <laughs> I don't know the age. Worry. Yes, the that's age that you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's what I want to know. So, so the, the age bracket is between 18, ages of 18 and 35. I didn't say that um, our goal also is to ensure that minimum 50% uh, uh, of our total target are trained. We can train more, but minimum we aim for 50%. Okay. okay. So it's, it's just 18 and 35. It doesn't cross. Well, um, so this is, our, family, this is our, to be to here this now. Is our, this <laughs> is our guidance. These are guidance, but we also look at exceptional cases and, and make exception where where, I mean, there have been a couple of cases that have come up. We'll make exceptions where okay, it's necessary. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great. Yes, sir. Yeah. My, my first question goes to Mr. William. 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 Yeah. Uh, you talk of data collection and other things. You were dealing in IT. Yeah. Uh, before the data collection, I think, if you have someone who hasn't or who does not have any idea about the uh, computer and the IT. Can you employ such a person? Since I know before you get the data, you need the raw information. Such people can go around and get the information for you. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So yes, uh, you don't need certain set of skills to collect data. Yeah. You just have to be familiar using you know smart devices. Like now, we all know how to use our smartphones. Yeah. And tablets and all that. So it's very, very easy. 
uh, even Ghana, we uh, when you go to rural, you have a lot of people educated. We we doing this for the uh, Liberian government, for example. And you know, because of the war in uh, Liberia, the education level is quite low. Mm -hmm. So I was in Liberia for close to three months. We were going to rural areas to employ people to collect data. So yes, I mean, really compared to Ghana, Ghana is much more you know improved education wise. So you don't need a certain set of skills. We will train you on how to use our application to collect data, you know. And uh, we are planning to make a, what we call agent network, where we'll have permanent people stationed in rural areas, so that once, it, not for Isoko or any uh, organizations express its interest in collecting data from the rural areas, we just, you know, mobilize our people and people will collect this data. And I must add that even the government planting for food. Yeah. We yeah. we were we piloted, you know, uh, the program where we might use our technologies to map up uh, about two hundred thousand farmers' farms wow. for the government, so that they are able to see uh, that if Mr. Albert is a farmer, you know, all information about his farm, his farm size, and all that. So to answer your question, you don't necessarily need any set of skills. We can train you to become a data collector. Awesome. And then to uh, Mr. Uh, Femi. Femi. Yes. Femi. Okay. How long will it take a candidate or somebody to complete the pre MES program? Uh, the pre MES program uh, skills, because we have to. Pre MES program for skills is actually uh, a 10 week program. 10 weeks? 10, ten, ten weeks, yes. Mm -hmm. But to come in, we also make you do some courses, okay. uh, pre-learning. So roughly you would do um, about 44 hours of learning on your own and then show the evidence, the certification as part of your admission. Okay. So so roughly, that will come to bring us to, let's say, so I've taken the this course discussing myself. Even though on paper it says four hours, it can be eight hours. Okay. So roughly by the time you are you complete the, pro, the pre mes program, You've done 12 weeks of, of learning, and some of that is a project that you write, that you that you build. So you choose a software project to maybe to solve some problem, and then build the software, and then present it. So we teach them not just to write code, but to also be able to present, um, and and present before a crowd, present technical um, uh, uh, the technical work. So it's it's presenting business in different. Technical. So we train them also to present technical work. Okay. This is this in-house? Um, we run five pi four pilots in-house, and then the rest were working on partners. Okay. But we, we, we built the template, and then we train the partners, and then the partners are happy to do Okay. Another one. <laughs> because it's about training, I think there is something that you have to pick. Um, the, all our programs up to now are fully funded. They don't need to pay. Okay. <laughs> okay, let, let's take. Uh, okay, um, can you mention your first name? Like you said? Okay, I'm Sharifa. And I want to find out you, mes you mentioned some job opportunities at Isoku. Is there a link or. Sure. I think that what I will do is to leave on contact right uh, so that for the program you can follow up. But I think when you go to our website, you know the job opportunities are there. But I will, I will equally leave my contact so that you can follow up. Maybe if I can add up. To yes, sir. Okay, so at the Ghana Community Exchange, when we started in 2018, we actually opened up for internship opportunities. That's how we started the recruitment. So um, I'm just saying that these opportunities also exist within organizations. So let's begin to create that kind of spirit of volunteerism. Sometimes you don't really just think about, okay, I want to volunteer for your organization. So how do I... It's more like a foot in the door approach. Yes. Then you know the value and the worth that you come with yeah. and how you can help the organization to really become better. So once you get in, then you begin to you know, work out your way by learning on the job and applying all the skills that are needed. And I'm sure that 
diagnosed. They have, we've had staff who have actually landed permanent roles by virtue of the fact that they actually volunteer to be part of, 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 of the organization. And so in very key roles now, we've had people who have actually started from as interns, and now they have acquired very important roles within the Ghana Community Exchange. So this is an example of a growing organization that is giving right. young people like you uh, opportunities to be able to rise through their run. And we have the conscious internship program which is actually structured so you would have to learn it's not like you are just staying in maybe the central uh, depository department or value chain department but you are moving across the department to acquire other skills and over time we are able to place you in where your passion and uh, you can contribute more to the organization so let's let's begin to have that spirit of volunteerism and awesome. also take advantage of some of the opportunities that we have and that, that would be very very helpful yeah. awesome 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 yeah. guys um, Honestly, my job here would be tagged a failed one if after we close, I mean, you do not grab any value out of this. I'll be so disappointed. Yes. So please, we have Mr. Isoko here. I'll, I'll name you by the organization. We have Mr. GCX here. We have Mr. Mest Africa over here. Please, if it's the pre mest you're talking about, immediately you walk out, pursue it. If it's the Isoko opportunities you want, or the GCX opportunities, so that it's it's practical. I hope you, you get yeah. me. Yeah. Um, there is a question from space, outer space to wow. Mr. Femi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's from my boss. So mm -hmm. I'll ask you, like we said, we have online. Oh, so, okay. so like, like we, I, I'm going to read a question, and then we'll hear, we'll hear from Mr. Femi. Mm -hmm. Please, we want to hear Mr. Femi talk about his career journey. Wow. And lessons learned, wait, over 30 years. Wow. wow. <laughs> I love the question. I can't wait to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so, sir, the floor is. You can give us a compressed version. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I started my career in 1990 um, with my national service back in Nigeria uh, with an IT company after my general degree. Um, I worked in different roles. Infrastructure. So my background is infrastructure, actually, uh, building networks, and so, uh, installing servers and supporting them. And um, I, you know, moved around, did training, did uh, maintenance, you know, support, and then um, um, moved into sales. So a lot of my work was into sales. And one day I woke up and said, "Look, I don't want to be a salesman. I am a technical person." So. I went back and did what I call my own personal industrial attachment, mm -hmm. where I went to take a job that wasn't necessarily paying as much as I wanted, but that would help me grow my engineering, my technical skills. And it was then I actually started working on my certification. So for, for, for us back then, and I think for young people now, your learning is so important, and also to have evidence to show that you have um, acquired the learning and the skills. So back then, it was Microsoft certificate that was very popular. So I became a Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer. And then along the path I took up um, also was Compaq then, Compaq um, Systems Engineer, it's now called HP, because HP acquired Compaq. Um, along the process also, I joined um, a company called ValueCard then. Um, ValueCard in Nigeria is, is almost like what we call debit cards today, but it's, it's a payment wallet, but on a chip. Mm. So this was the early days of um, card, payments in, in Africa and it was a consortium of 19 banks or no of 11 banks they now grew to 32 banks before I left but again helped me deepen my technical skills because we built out the network supported I think probably over 60 servers distributed in the, these banks um, for our system and then joined Econet then in 2001 uh, Econet has gone through several um, transitions now called Airtel you, you must be familiar in Nigeria okay. but it was then one of the two telecom uh, GSM companies that were licensed in Nigeria in 2001 um, because I joined this later massive company at a small stage it helped me to actually also grow my own career my personality um, my able to, ability to navigate large organizations and see when you see a big company today what did they go through to mm. get to where they are so I learned so much both in my technical space as well as in a non-technical space. Um, it was while in Kodeh that I decided to take my first MBA, um, uh, Lagos Business School Nigeria, and it helped me significantly because 
there were changes going on in my organization. They were, we were getting acquired by other organizations. And this, this helped me understand organization dynamics. What happens when one organization comes to acquire another one? All the cultural changes, the marketing changes, the branding changes, you know, what the impact was. And then um, from then on, I continued with Econet until 2010. Uh, by this time, it was called Airtel. And Airtel had just acquired the company. And then Airtel did um, a deal with IBM. Um, where IBM would support all their IT all over Africa. And in that process, I got moved from Airtel into IBM. Again, another boost in my career because from just working in Nigeria, I started supporting other countries. Um, first, it was nine Af West African countries, and then later, 17 African countries. Had a team at the time of about 25 technical people and project managers sitting in India supporting um, Africa. And then in 2015, I got asked by IBM to move to Ghana to come and oh, um, help another one of the operations, Fidelity Vanguard. Oh, um, oh wow. So I came as an executive, delivery executive to support Fidelity Vanguard Ghana with the IT operations. Oh, fine. And I was there till 2018. Again, um, my career had been largely telecoms before now, and that exposed me to um, uh, now banking and finance. Uh, in the process, just before coming, I started my second MBA. Wow. Um, uh, this time at Warwick Business School. So I have two MBAs 10 years apart. Um, wow. But the benefit again is after having grown you know, in, in, in the industry, now doing another MBA, uh, this time with a proper um, project, because now I wrote a thesis. Um, it helped me to really deepen my knowledge, not just of business, but of business in this modern age yeah. Yeah. with how things are changing. And I wrote my, my thesis on adoption of cloud uh, technology in Ghana, you know, and sub-Saharan Africa. So this helped me because the, at, at, in 2014, cloud business was becoming, you know, prevalent in Africa. So um, doing this not only helped me understand the technology, but also the um, human dynamics. What are the things that make people change their behavior to accept new things, new technology? And um, this, of course, prepared me for leaving IBM and starting my own business for a short while, about a year. So I had entrepreneurship experience for a year, um, uh, consulting in AI and blockchain. And then, um, again, just for young people, before leaving IBM, my knowledge of AI was not very small, but not much. Uh, because we also took a challenge to build the first um, service desk agent while I was at Fidelity for IBM. Um, and it was the first in Africa, but we said, look, we can do this. We went and got all the information, researched, and put together about a team of three, four people, some developers, and put it, built it, and it was functionally first in IBM in Africa. And this, when I came out, helped me to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to start consulting in this space. Mm -hmm. So I started training myself in AI. Um, the free courses all over the place. I took free courses, um, the IBM has a platform, uh, with free courses. I took free courses, got certifications. Um, I have over 30 certifications in, in different things, AI, um, design thinking, you know, um, blockchain, and some of them required hands-on exercises. So I actually would go on, build models. So I'm, I'm so happy to hear, to meet Isoko mm -hmm. here today. <laughs> <laughs> One of my trainees at MEST, when I forget I joined MEST, was building uh, something, a predictive, a model to predict price Pricing, of yeah. yam. Okay. And he got his data from his circle. So oh. this, this is why, um, <laughs> you know. But I, I actually helped, I told him this was possible. Mm -hmm. We could build this. And I helped him build the first, first model. Oh, no, yeah. You know, subsequently, mm -hmm. they will learn the, the, the process and yeah. build many more models by themselves. Mm -hmm. So you can train yourself. You can build your career. Education never stops. Wow. And there are so many opportunities to learn. So I think this is a big thing in my own career. I'm a design thinking. Um, and I say experts now, I teach design thinking, I teach product management, even though I have a technical background. But these, these are all things I learned along the way. Okay, thank you very much. Wow. Thank you for sharing that education never stops. Yes. That is amazing. Please, we, we, we don't have um, any more. I think we have exceeded our time at seven minutes. But if anyone has one last question, we can take it. There's a, oh, I wasn't seeing the hand. Okay, yes. I'm Deborah. 
Please, I wanted to ask Mr. Femi concerning the Premex program. Um, as a family woman, I wanted to know if there is any um, outline that since we are the family type and time limited with studying and other stuff, any program I outline for us and then with financial side too. Okay. Um, the first four pilot programs were actually all virtual. So you could sit in your house and take the course. Okay. Um, so it's, it's irrelevant. I mean, it's, not, it's irrelevant, but yeah, you, you can do it. And we have married people um, who, who took the course who graduated from the program. Um, the current one that we just graduated people in was, was physical in the various hubs. But we, at some point, we decided to introduce a virtual track. So two of our partners actually have a virtual track for people who also maybe are studying or are working during the day and can't come, so they take a virtual class. So the opportunities are there um, uh, for, for, work, for working and married people. Thank you very much. Great. I think we have any more time for questions. I don't know how long our speakers are going to stay after the session. They might leave. But please, let's not forget this. By close of the day, make sure that you, you, you have caught some value. Maybe we will need their contact. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll give you the yes, contact. Yes, okay. no, once uh, SFAN has okay. your details, whatever you need, they can, they can send it to you. So okay. thank you so much again, Mr. William Ajiman, Mr. Um, Albert Tego, and then Mr. Fermi. Um, I've really enjoyed this, this, this session. Thank you so much for the wisdom and the knowledge you have shared to our audience. So we will bring this to a close now and continue with the program. My name again is Prince Eduapia.